So to start kind of the ball rolling, um, let's look at that. Now, what we see here is, can, can everybody see it? Am I obstructing the view now? Uh, so, as you can see, that's the what? Basically, the statistics for our mutual trade, right? Uh, as you can see on the graph, uh, our relations have degraded, well, quite a bit. When? In 2014, right? You know, the, after this, well, just Ukrainian crisis, after all this, uh, let's call it political turmoil that started after it, uh, after the sanctions were imposed on Russia by various states, well, our relations started degrading quite a bit. Well, we all know that Austria was among the few countries that was, well, still neutral, let's put it like that, right, uh, towards, uh, well, Russian foreign policy and towards well, this whole sanction hysteria that um, uh, came later. But actually, um, still, as you can see from the charts, uh, well, only in 2017, we actually started kind of crawling back well, to the previous figures. We started actually, we returned more or less well, to our previous figures. But again, three years were basically lost, right? Which is quite, uh, well, just quite unfortunate. Um, a question to you guys. Uh, what does Austria sell to Russia or export to Russia? What do you think? Well, mostly. Equipment. Yes, all kinds of electronic equipment, equipment for machinery. Quite true. Yes, please. Uh, there was a hand I somewhere there. I wanted to suggest chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, actually, actually, you're yeah, absolutely right. Now, all the kind of traditional quote unquote, right, Austrian stuff is also well sold in Russia, and those of you who managed, actually, I mean, the Austrian part, or right, uh, who managed to visit our stores, you might have well even seen some. Austrian food products and stuff like that. Anything else? Yes, so there are quite a lot of, a lot of infrastructure projects. So maybe right. Some tools for exactly. For building. Exactly. Now uh, let's just click here. So here you can see what was that actually? Oh, it's Russian export to Austria. Now let's click it there. Uh, so that's actually again the figures, right? We're not going to focus much on figures, but you can see that well machinery has the biggest part. Uh, by machinery, I mean pretty much everything that comes onto this very broad term, right? Machinery for industry, for agriculture, and again, machinery for just IT sectors. And you might know that Russian IT sector is one of the fastest growing in the world, right? So also Austrian companies are present in this particular sphere. It's chemical goods, again, in the broadest understanding of it. Because under chemical goods also falls what? Well, chemical goods. There's goods for what? For Arms. industry? Arms. Pharmacy. Pharmacy, exactly. It's all kind of drugs, well, pills, I don't know, whatever comes under this. And manufactured goods. Again, manufactured goods is pretty much everything else, right? Starting from, I don't know, I'm not sure about clothes or textiles, but to chocolate, to, I don't know, watch, to, again, just home appliances, stuff like that, right? And what does Russia sell to Austria? What do you think? Oh, we just saw it. Oh, yes, <laughs> indeed you did. So, energy, of course, well, uh, actually, of course, but it's an unfortunate thing, uh, in my opinion, at least, right? Energy has this dominant part, right? Um, and it's, well, 80%, 80 percent, 80 plus percent. Uh, then goes manufactured goods, right? Again, a question to the Austrian well, part of the group. Uh, what Russian goods do you know? Well, just imagine a typical, again, quote unquote, Austrian shop or shop somewhere in Austria, let's put it like that. What's the typical, what's the first Russian good that comes to your mind? Alcohol. Okay, yeah, alcohol. No, <laughs> well, do they sell them a lot? <laughs> I doubt it. Not in grocery stores. Not in grocery stores. Maybe some chocolate stores. version of it, but no. Oh, well. Okay, it's alcohol, right? What else? Caviar. Caviar, right. Right, stuff like that. Anything else? Well, that, well chocolates, right. Because Russia does produce a lot. Well, some of it is good, some of it is medium quality, but generally it's okay. Uh, so, right, and commodities. Uh, do you see the difference between energy and commodities, right? So, commodities is basically everything that you do not use to generate what? Electricity, right? Or heat, because energy, that's what we use it mostly for. And commodities is pretty much everything else. It may, may be wood, 
that's not used again for heating or electricity generation or stuff like that. Uh, or it can be well, raw materials in every form. So it's more or less like that. Uh, is there, do you do like what you see on the slide actually? <laughs> No, nobody does actually. Nobody does. Um, why is it like that? Again, today we're going to talk uh, a bit, in, uh, look into the details in the energy sphere because it is important, and that's where kind of young people of your, even my age, because I still consider myself relatively young. Well, I flatter myself that way. Um, and um, the thing is that uh, that needs to be changed definitely, right? On one hand. The usual explanation that is given by our authorities is that Russia is a relatively young capitalist country, right? We haven't yet developed, well, fully in terms of well, production of particular goods that could, uh, could uh, earn their place on the global market. Is it a good explanation? Well, no, not quite, right? The reality is much, well, simpler and harsher at the same time because energy Actually, is it good when you are able to sell oil and gas? Yes. Yes. What's so great about it? Everybody needs it. It's fast money. Everybody needs it. Absolutely right. It's fast money. Absolutely right. And but but apart from being fast, what else is so great about getting things from, from oil and gas? You shouldn't invest a lot of like you should invest quite. You should invest, but the return on good. the investment will be quite big and quick, so to say. And what else? Um, and they are dependent. Uh, um, again, in the next, I think, slide, we are going to see the map of Russian pipelines going to Europe and to Austria as well, and we'll just discuss this well, question that's on the verge of being a political and economic question, as you understand. It's that's pretty much. Uh, yes, it is a stable market, very good. And another thing is that comparing to other well, goods, like selling machinery, for example, or manufactured goods, you don't need uh, to spend. Pardon? You shouldn't compete. Well, you should, but you are, again, absolutely right. The competition is not as cutthroat, mm -hmm. right, as with, say, selling cars, for example, yes. right? You can't compete with Germany in this aspect, right? No matter how, how many cars or how good even, or how good of a quality our cars is, you can't compete with Germany, at least right now, or with some other countries, right? Um, you can, but on the very small and niche markets, let's put it mm -hmm. like that, right? The thing is that you don't have to spend that much simply effort, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm driving at is, now let's look at um, this map. Now, just, I'm being filmed, but I still have to, to stand up because I'll need to show this now something here. Now, guys, um, what I like, uh, actually, there's one thing that I really like about this map. It's widely used because, well, it includes the South Stream, the project that never happens, it includes the North Stream, and this map is relatively well known. Uh, and some, one thing I dislike about this, what I dislike is Crimea is not part of Russia, for some reason. So it's not actually um, very patriotic, so to say. Uh, so, on a serious note, um, let's look at this uh, map. The red lines show... The red lines show what? The pipelines, right? That go from Russia to Europe. And Again, Austria in particular. Now, a question to you. What seems odd on this map? Event. Uh, to give you a hint here, actually, in, the, in this part of the map. Something feels odd or, well, just interesting. Depends on you. Yeah? Um, most of the pipelines that start in Russia, they end exactly. They end where? Germany. In Germany, right? And in what part of Germany? East. Eastern Germany, right? Uh, why is that? Because from, we still have this pipeline from the Soviet times. Exactly. Now, the no absolute majority of pipelines uh, that we still have and are on this map, apart from Northrum, which is a relatively new one, right? As you know, and we are going to discuss it today. Um, these are uh, the pipelines that were built back in 1960s, right? You must remember, from your history classes, or perhaps from your parents, that back then Europe was basically divided, right, into uh, kind of blocks, right? The capitalist block to the west, and the Warsaw Treaty countries to the east, the socialist block, right? Most of the pipelines were built till Eastern Germany for two main reasons. The first reason is, Eastern Germany was the most what? 
Well, <laughs> Western part of Eastern Shore, and industrially it was the most developed, actually, place, right? Uh, yes, it was. A lot of, of its infrastructure was destroyed in the war, we know that, but still, well, they managed to kind of rebuild it, and uh, the so called, well, miracle happened not only in Western part, but in Eastern as well. They also rebuilt the economy quite, well, really, the economy quite intensively. And that's the first reason, because Germany requires a lot of resources. And the second reason, it might be quite surprising for you, was to do what? Because was Soviet Union actually selling the soil and yes or not? To their, well, let's call it friends or allies. No, it, it was always uh, much less than the, the, the real price. Exactly. Uh, technically, technically, it was, it was trade, technically, mm -hmm. right? Soviet Union was selling, but you're absolutely right. The prices were so low that they were almost on the same level as for the Soviet Union itself. What does it mean? It was a form of indirect, basically, what? Political support, right? Political and economic support. Why? Because Soviet Union was a typical industrial state, right? So an industrial state requires what? A lot of energy, right? To build more factories, to build them bigger, better, well, in their understanding, right? And so all of the Warsaw countries had to have access to cheap oil and gas. Well, back then oil was more important. So it's more or less clear. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia found itself in a quite a peculiar position. Because before the collapse, well, that was the border of Soviet Union, right? The, uh, Balkan state, uh, the Baltic Soviet states, uh, Ukraine, right? And well, this for our allies here. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia found itself in a very peculiar position, as I have already mentioned. Because now between Russia and the main recipient, again, being Germany and partly Austria, uh, appeared what? Several transit states, right? A question to you. Is it good being a transit state, or do you think? Yes. Actually, it's great, right? What's so great about it? You can sell it for more price. You can get charge more transit money. fees. Exactly. You charge transit fees. Well, you basically get money for pretty much doing nothing, just for being there, right? Yes, you have to, of course, you have to maintain the infrastructure, right? But, uh, well, it, it does work differently in, in case of different countries, actually, right? Because Ukraine you never yeah, spend a lot of time on it, and now it's on the verge of well, technological, well, civil technological issues, right? Uh, so, generally, it's quite good. The question is, is it good for the final bias or not? To have a lot of transit state between the, the seller country and the buyer country? Uh, no, it's not. I'll give you an example. Now, uh, Germany, despite well, having a lot of transit states, and the main ones are what? Belarus, mm -hmm. Ukraine, and at least one more. Well, Poland, to a certain extent, right? <laughs> to a less extent, but still. Now, let's start with Belarus. Um, Belarus, uh, is it getting uh, its oil and gas at the same price as, uh, for example, Austria? No. Or Germany? It is low. No. Again, it's almost as low as our domestic prices, mm -hmm. right? Was, was Ukraine getting it at the same price as, say, Germany or Austria or other countries? No. no. Also, at a very low mm -hmm. level. Uh, what made the situation worse? For countries like again, Austria, Italy, well, France to a less extent, because you know that the French economy or well, energy sector is mostly based on what? On nuclear power, right? So they're kind of less de uh, dependent, but again, it's debatable. What's made the situation worse is that m absolute majority of oil and gas goes where? To Germany. Which means effectively Germany, uh, effectively Germany became what? A hub for resources. What is a hub? It's pretty much a place where resources are being concentrated. What does Germany do after gathering the resources? And mind it, uh, Germany is gathering resources not only from Russia, but also from Norway, from the North Sea, and well, other places. So again, being effectively a hub. So what does Germany do after that? Charge fees. Uh, uh, who do they charge fees? And for what? Uh, for transport. Exactly. They, ba well, they basically, they quote unquote, resell. Resell. Right? 
their resources that they bought at one price to the rest of the European countries. Right? Uh, again, Austria being not being an exception in this case. Um, after 2014 and all that well, unfortunate events that started happening in Ukraine, um, actually even before that, to, to, to be fair, actually it all started I think in the year 2010 approximately, mm -hmm. Russia started thinking of what? Of, of what? It should not only Russia, Italy and Austria as well, by the way. We started thinking about what? New ways. Again, uh, exactly. New ways of how to do what? How to avoid Ukraine as a transit state. Why? Why? Because in a series of years, starting from 2006, each and every year we have some major problems with Ukraine being a transit state, right? Uh, either they start extracting gas to a big extent or something else. Who's to blame? A difficult question I'm going to raise. Actually, both sides are to blame. My students uh, actually know how much I despise gas pump. <laughs> I hate monopolies in general, I guess from in particular. Uh, well, uh, but um, that's just a different story. Now, start the session for other ways. The most kind of interesting project they came up was this one, the South Street. Mm -hmm. right? You know, it's basically a failed project, but to a certain extent. So the idea was uh, to bring resources from Russia to where? Bulgaria, mm -hmm. then cross uh, Greece and go to Italy, and, from, and a second branch would go from Bulgaria through the Balkan states to Austria, right? Why Austria? At least it was projected that way. Why Austria? There's everything up there. Exactly. Because Austria did not such a big well, hub as Germany, but still having your own separate gas, and it was a gas pipeline. Gas pipeline would, well, make the prices what? Lower, your industry is less dependent on the, that amount of energy that goes from Germany or other places, and generally everybody would be happy. And by the way, why Italy was so interested in this particular pipeline? Because it uh, doesn't want to be dependent on Germany, maybe. Well, on one hand, quite true, pretty much that was the reason of the pipeline, right? Yeah. To go, kind of to lower the dependence from Germany's well, dominant position in the energy market. And Maybe as it comes to South Italy, it could diminish this difference between North and South? Of the sort of, right, because we all know that the Northern part is well, generally more developed, at least industrially more developed. Right, what else? Again, why I, I like to show maps, because maps usually explain that. Maybe Italy could further sell it to Spain or the North. Exactly. Now, Italy is located very conveniently. What starts here? Africa. Africa, Northern Africa. Before this, well, again, tragedy, I can't find a word, the word for it, which happened to Libya, right? Again, no matter who's to blame, the country is basically non existent right now. Well, and North, Northern Africa is also a great source for oil and gas. So Italy has their own kind of master plan to do what? To become an alternative hub as well, right? Not only to fuel their own production, and they had this, I would call it delusion even, uh, that that would solve their economic problems. Right? Again, it's, it's quite debatable whether it would, and we know that Italy is a very poor state right now, and energy is what, just about a fraction of this program. Right? But still, well, they, they saw it as, as, as one of the means of how they can solve them, and the idea was for them to gather resources from northern uh, Africa from Russia, and thus become kind of an alternative hub, right? Thus fueling, kind of literally, fueling what? The Balkan states, Southern Europe, right? And then reselling it potentially to Spain and other countries. The project, as you know, never really what? Caught on, right? Yes. Where's that? Bulgaria didn't want to see. Exactly. Again, in our mass media, and according to what our officials or authorities say, uh, well, our position is that Bulgaria was pretty much forced not to accept it. Again, I'm not such a great specialist on this particular region, so I'll just refrain from giving my opinion here. But, uh, well, the result is indeed what it is. Uh, Bulgaria basically refused. And the third energy what? Packed or package, actually. You know what it is, right? It's basically a serious one several laws, they dictate what? That no European Union country, or a country that's aspiring to become European, to be in the European Union, can do what? 
can trade with companies that include production, refining, transportation, and selling of energy resources. The only company that falls under this particular description is Gazprom. Right? The Gazprom was never actually mentioned there. Of course, it's not. Right? But that's pretty much it. Another interesting thing is that um, Austria was one of the countries that was kind of helping us uh, during our talks, well, with the Balkan states and with us. Of course, Germany was not pretty uh, much happy about this particular project. The interesting thing is that according to the initial plan, uh, the pipeline was supposed to cross, as you can see, the Black Sea. And the first, and this is kind of interesting how it works. The first question that uh, appeared was to move it closer to Crimea than Ukraine, right? Or to move it closer to Turkey. How did we decide to build it? In the middle. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because the Black Sea does not have neutral waters. Uh, like other big pools of water. Yeah, but according to the UN Convention of 1982 on marine borders, uh, they, may, they may be such a thing as neutral waters. The Black Sea does not have neutral waters. So it had to be either Ukraine, because of Crimea, or Turkey. Turkey, Turkey of course. Were the Turks happy? Of course they were. Again, getting free money just. Well, they were experienced because Kazakhstan does. Exactly. Exactly. Now, after the project basically failed, uh, Russia again found itself in a pretty peculiar position. Why? Uh, the position was that, on one hand, we, on one hand, we have uh, we have to sell pretty much this uh, gas to our European partners because, well, on one hand, we have a lot of it. And the second thing is that, well, it would still be a good thing because when we started well, our discussion, uh, we said that having a pipeline between two countries creates a dependence. But what's important to understand is always mutual dependence, right? Always mutual. Again, uh, the, the classical vision of again, mass media, certain political authorities, is that the, um, that the selling country is usually has the dominant part. Why isn't it true, by the way? Okay, why is it, why is it true? In what aspect is it true? Is the question clear? Oh, well, so, I guess, it, uh, yes, please. I guess the dependency is the fact that if the country doesn't have energy, it can't heat the homes people live in. So that's, right. it's politically very, very risky. I guess right. on the other side, uh, um, for the delivering country, let's say, um, especially if the country is very much dependent on deliveries of energy resources, uh, if for whichever reason there is a reduction in that, that means a reduction in revenue for the state. Exactly. Now, uh, all those contracts that Russia has with Germany and with Austria, what does actually stipulate to the contracts? Pipeline contracts, I mean. The quantity, right? Of oil or gas sold. What else? The price. But uh, just let's be careful with the price. Uh, is the price set as a figure? As a particular well, figure? Like $100 per barrel? Is that like that? No, it's never like that, right? In long term, big contracts, it's always what? A formula of the price. And the formula is designed in such a manner that at the core of the formula is what? The world's average price, mm -hmm. pretty much the exchange price. No matter being for oil or for gas, right? Pretty much it. And, but the formula is always written in such a manner that the seller is in slightly better position. It will, this country will always be getting slightly more, right? Why is that? Because the selling part has to bear all the risks, in most cases. When you build a pipeline, it's usually the seller's part who will take the risks. When Austria was, was financing, well, supposed to finance South Stream, again, all the risks were still moved to Gazprom, right? Because you are the selling part. And that's where you charge slightly more than you are actually should shoot, right? Uh, so in that matter, in that matter, indeed, the, the, the buying class, the buyer is in a, well, is in this position that it actually has to agree with such terms. But on the other hand, pipeline contracts are long-term contracts. By long-term, in 15 to 20 years long, right? So both sides have to do what? Have to plan their 
production have to plan the expenses or incomes, which is a good thing. But at the very same time, if you have a long-term contract, you can't easily break it as it is, if something goes wrong. You have actually both sides. In that matter, it is kind of interdependence. Well, when we speak about tanker trading or delivering LNG, liquefied natural gas, well, that's a different story, right? Because they call it, these are usually sport contracts and they're kind of well, work in a different manner. But just returning to South Stream, uh, the thing is that since Russia already started building it, and Bulgaria pretty much banned uh, these um, contracts and the third energy pact, what did Turks offer us? It's kind of an interesting story several years ago. About, uh, do you mean about the uh, which uh, well, Yes, uh, but that happened slightly later. Mm -hmm. Just be before this uh, campaign in Syria, before they shot down our military plane, and before all that. They offered to buy all of the gas that we were supposed to deliver to uh, Italy and Austria. Uh, the idea was either to build a pipeline from Russia to Turkey and then kind of by Greece uh, move it to Austria and uh, Italy, thus kind of avoiding Bulgaria. Uh, and actually both Italy and Austria were quite okay with it, but actually the Turks pretty much refused. And they uh, offered us what? So they built this European part of Exactly. That why Russia? Well, but basically told us, Russia, why bother? You should buy all of the gas you have to offer. We will build our own hub here, in our western borders. And then we'll, on our own, discuss with the countries of the Balkan region, and with Italy, and Austria, and other countries, and we'll decide with them how we're going to disperse this gas over the place. Did Russia have much of a choice? in such a you know, difficult political economic situation. Well, no, actually we didn't. That's why the so-called Turkish stream appeared, right? But what made, well, kind of made uh, the uh, situation worse for Central and West European countries is that the Turks are doing what right now? They are gathering resources, not only from Russia via Blue Stream and its enhancement uh, pipelines, but they also gather resources from where? Exactly. Now, what's this country? Azerbaijan. What's this? The Caspian Sea, right? And what's this country? Turkmenistan, right? Uh, as you can see from the map, again, a confirmation by NASA Wood, uh, is that these countries have no other option but to deal with Turkey in terms of selling their oil and gas to Europe. They have physically kind of no other way to do it, right? So, and the question of selling good, uh, the selling oil and gas um, to Europe is a question of their kind of long-term economic uh, survivability, so to say, both from Azerbaijan and from Turkmenistan. So what are they doing pretty much right now? Building a pipeline to get the resources from the Caspian Sea via Turkey and again to Europe. No, geographically, other ways are simply impossible, right? Uh, what the moral of this, well, just story. The moral is, while Europe and Russia were fighting over Ukraine, the Turks won. Well, uh, well I leave it to you to, uh, to consider whether it was a good thing or not, and well, whether Europeans in general will benefit, because, well, technically, every side got them what they wanted, right? Uh, European Union as a whole, not Austria in particular, or Italy or other countries, but European Union as a whole got an alternative sort of pipeline, alternative to, to Russia, right? So it's technically not Russian uh, gas with all these taps and air pipelines that are being constructed right now, etc. Russia technically also got what it wanted, right? It got another pipeline, but again, it's not going directly to Europe, it's going to Turkey. So, but, but still, in general, well, it's quite debatable whether when the energy plays the way it should. Now, that's about energy. This is more or less clear. Okay. Now, uh, just let's just remember the state of this map. Um, another question that we need to discuss is actually investment. Right? You know what investment is. What is investment? In your own words. It's uh, the money which is paid for some projects. 
Money that is put into a company to uh, purchase equipment or mm. materials needed to produce something which should economically be viable. Okay, very good. And very good. Mm. And Yes, very good. Yes, please. of investments in your future, right? But that's kind of the broad term, right? The definition. Well, uh, if we stick to, uh, well, what's written in economics textbooks, then indeed, uh, investment is, again, well, pretty much putting money, giving money to a particular company, usually by buying what? Securities. It's clear what securities is, right? Shares, bonds, obligation, this, this, this kind of papers, right? Uh, and in order to get partly control over this company or project, right? And to get profit. So it's more or less clear. Now, uh, before we move to, well, Russian investments in Austria, North Korea, North Korea, Russia, another thing that we need to discuss. There are basically three types of investment, right? The first is what? Direct investment. You've heard of it, they're done, right? So it's all over the, the, the press, whatever. So what is direct investment? Hmm? Well, direct investment is, well, just, just, just imagine you have let's say, 1 million euros, for example, or dollars, or no matter what, right? So, and you put this money, you give this money to a company, and in return, again, you get what? Shares of this company for this particular sum. So it's clear, right? Is it a risky thing to do or not? Depends on the circumstances and right. yeah, many other factors. Right. Because you it, can lose all, all your money. Exactly. And, right. Uh, there was a hand there. Hmm? That's pretty much it, right? So, absolutely right. If you have extra money, well, that's your last money, so to say, right? No matter. Uh, you invest it, then um, actually it's, it's really risky. Even if you invest in a reliable, stable company, bad things happen. Right? In our economy, we know that. A crisis may happen, right? A local crisis may happen, right? And again, today we'll touch, um, uh, we'll, we'll touch, uh, slide or scratch the question of uh, this 2008 crisis and why it happened and how it actually influenced our relations. Um, they'll show you uh, how it actually worked. But generally, it is considered risky. Is the potential income big? Yes. Yes. It's extremely big. Right? So it's this very difficult situation when you have to decide between big potential income and big risks at the very same time. What other type of investment do you know? Portfolio investment, right? What's that? Ever heard of it? Yes, it's more, more sort of a fast money. You invest a right. little, it takes a little ten, less than 10%. Right, very good. Well, the technical speaking, technical yes, it's less than 10%. And yes. it is less risky because you don't lose so much money, but it's right. much risky for the company that gets it. Right. But what is the good portfolio? Well, you know what portfolio is? Well, it's basically what? A fold or it can be a mm -hmm. what, handbag. It's basically portfolio, right? So why was it called that way, portfolio? Because you have different companies that they are like in right. a portfolio. Exactly. So you have this, again, million euros. You don't put all this money to one company, right? You disperse this money, well, let's say five companies, just for simplicity's sake, right? Five companies. So as a result, is it risky? Uh, it's less risky, let's put it like that, right? Why? Because one company may bring you profit, another two may not. But the third and the fourth company and the fifth will bring a profit as well. Will the general profit be as big as with direct investment? Yeah. No, never. At best, you will not lose your money, right? Or gain some minor profit. But at the very same time, the risks are extremely low, right? Because since you disperse money, well, you can kind of... So it's one of them ways of to do what? What kind of... Correctly speaking, to hedge your risks. Right, to add your investment, right? And what's the third type of investment? Convertible loan. 
Uh, that's true, but uh, usually if you look up the statistics, it's written just simply what's written. It's written other, other investments. Other is pretty much any kind of other monetary transfer that does not fall under direct and portfolio investment, right? It's money, pardon? Indirect. Or indirect, so to say. Uh, it's monetary transfers, it's non-profit organization, it's charity funds, it's religious organizations, stuff like that, right? Um, that's about investment. Um, is this, this one? Yes, it is. Now, if you look carefully at this particular slide, you'll see that the cumulative Russian investment is 26.7 billion US dollars. If you look at the Austrian investment in Russia, it's 5.6 um, billion. Does it feel odd to you or strange? Yeah. So, on one, so what do you see from these statistics? On one hand, we, by the way, in Russia, right? We kind of invest heavily in Austria, right? Accumulate capital there. In return, we get a much smaller figure. What does it show? Austrian firms don't know how to invest in Russia for. Uh, yes, actually, you're quite correct. I don't think it's not a question of knowing how to do it. It's a question of, uh, of, of being afraid. Yes, actually, absolutely right. Of being afraid. Because Russia, no matter how many open classes we have, right? No matter how many foreign students in our university we have, still there is this image of Russia as being a dark, cold, scary place. Uh, and stuff like that. But, well, this probably will overcome it sometime. Um, so, but what else does it show? It shows not a very good sign, so to say. Um, when your country invests, uh, actually, uh, let's start from another angle, so to say. Uh, Russia has all, the, by Russia I mean the country that appeared in 1993, of course, right? Uh, Russia has always had what? Capital flight. What's the capital flight? The outflow is of capital. The outflow of money. When more money leaves your country than it comes in. It's clear, right? Just in general. Usually it's in forms of direct or portfolio investment, and transnational companies are, well, the companies that do that. Right? But not only that, of course. So Russia traditionally has capital outflow. Is it good or bad? What do you think? For Russia. <laughs> for, for, well, for just for Russia, Russia, right? Yes, it's bad. Yeah. A good advice uh, for everybody here, uh, for, for your life ahead. When you're asked a question, good or bad, or any comparative question, you always need to realize what? What you are comparing with what, basically, right? So, generally speaking, it's neither bad nor good. Right? Right. So, when you, let's take two countries, Russia and the United States. Right? Both have huge capital outflow, just huge capital outflow. But the reason for capital outflow is quite different, right? When in Russia money leaves the country, it goes where? Just to place it, basically. Exactly. One of them is offshore zones. You know what offshore zones are, right? You know, right? Why would you put money to an offshore zone if you are a company? To either evade taxes altogether or to have lower taxation or, or to loan the money, as simple as that. Because money may have a well, kind of a shady origin, I guess, put it like that. Uh, and the, another place, and the other actually place, where Russians like to put their money? Real estate? Banks. Banks. Real estate um, is still kind of investment, right? So, but yes, banks. Just put your money in a bank, preferably in some far away country, because, well, so are Austrian banks good? Yes, Austrian banks are good, right? So, if you look, um, actually, I never really made this slide for some reason, but if you look at the countries that enjoy the most of Russian investment, you'll see that Austria is, I think, in the top 10. Well, it's not top 7 or something like that. Uh, why is that? Does it mean that Austria is an offshore zone for Russia? No. Austria, unlike Britain, actually, the thing is, um, what country is on the first place? 
in, in terms, terms of Russian investments, investments in this country. country. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, given that you just said Britain. Uh, well, Britain is not on the first okay, place, okay. right? But yes, Britain is somewhere in the top, at least top three. I think it's second or the third place. No, 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 no. Switzerland. The country that gets the most of Russian investment. Ah, maybe Netherlands. Uh, close, but not. Again, yeah, Netherlands is somewhere in the top five. Cyprus. Cyprus. <laughs> and the funny thing is that Cyprus, at the same time, is the largest investor in the Russian economy. Oh, you know the mighty well, economy of Cyprus, right? So, uh, how does it work? Again, that's pretty much an offshore zone, right? So, you invest money into an offshore zone, you keep this money there for some time, then you do what? You reinvest, basically, this money back. Because how does it work with developing states like Russia? For example, you have the same million of euros, right? You send it to Cyprus. You keep it there for a year, two, five, no matter how long, right? Then you start a well, joint company, for example, Russian-Austrian company or Russian-British company, doesn't matter. Company there. Then you kind of return this money here to Russia, technically laundering it, right? Because now it's not Russian money, it's what? Money from Cyprus. Though originally it is Russian money. And what do you get? You get benefits from the government for attracting foreign investment. That's how it works, right? So Austria is definitely, well, as for this offshore uh, well, places, it's again Cyprus, Bahamas, Britain to a certain extent. Well, what I really like about the British, uh, and we do have very close cooperation with uh, Britain, I mean, our faculty, we have a joint program with Britain, etc. What do you like about them? They will never admit that. No matter how many times I'm bringing it up, they will never admit that they are actually, technically, an offshore zone for Russian capital. No, we are not an offshore zone, we are a financial center of the world. They tend to say that. No matter how you call yourself, you're actually an offshore Right, so, Austria, luckily, kind of does not play as a, this offshore role. Austria is, well, liked by Russian businessmen because of the banks. Right? So usually shady money does not really go to Austria that much, right? Because Austria, as, uh, as well as United States, Germany, and other countries, well, you guys are quite what? They are quite picky about what money comes to your country. That's, that's a good thing, because that's your reputation, basically, right? Because if you start accepting shady money, no matter from China, from Russia, from other developing states, well, that's not going to work fine for you at the end, right? So, I'm telling you, and uh, uh, speaking of uh, Austrian investment in, investment in Russia, um, one thing we have already mentioned, people are simply afraid to invest in Russia. Though later I'll show you, well, why later now? I'll show you something interesting. Now, as you can see, there are two, 1,200 Austrian companies in Russia. Railways, aviation, hydro energy, construction, etc. So, this is some serious stuff. Sorry for this other reason, right? So, it's some serious, well, things that Austrian companies do in Russia. There are 500 Russian companies in Austria, right? Uh, mostly energy, but energy not production, right? Because Austria, you know, we don't have that many resources, right? Uh, but it's mostly kind of selling, reselling, and stuff like that. It's metals, chemical industry, transport. Right? Um, what we see here is that, on one hand, the general amount of the investment is relatively small to Russia. And, but the amount of companies is much bigger than Russian companies in uh, Austria. What, what, what does that mean? It means that this, out of these 500 companies, a lot of them are what? Big businesses, right? Big businesses that work with some big major fields. But still, in general, the situation does not really look as good as perhaps we would like it to be. So, but there's a way out. Uh, what's the savings rate? Do you happen to know? Uh, even if you guys do not have any economic education background, you still might have heard. Savings rate, even from the name. 
everything. But sum is rate is basically a rate that shows how much you save, right? Uh, let's, let me give you the following example. So uh, imagine you are a household. What is a household? It's basically one family, right? You're a household and you have some income. For simplicity's sake, let's say that your income is 100 euros, just to put it simple. Uh, how, how much will you save from this particular sum? What percent? 100 euros. 30 percent. If it were 1,000 euros, also 30, 10,000 euros. Yeah. Should it be growing or falling? That's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, guys, the interesting thing is that um, savings rate is a very, very important indicator, right? When in your country a savings rate is high, it means pretty much one thing. What? That the population is reluctant to spend. And why is your population most likely reluctant to spend? The prices are high, exactly. The expectations of your economy are pretty, is, are pretty low, right? They are afraid of something, or they are simply not well financially educated properly. They do not know what to do. Because what do you usually do with your savings? You can either invest them or spend them. That's pretty much it. Actually, one of the reasons why Soviet Union initially collapsed was people had savings, mm -hmm. but you could not invest in Soviet times, right? You could either put it to the bank or spend it. But in order to spend it, you would just go to the market and buy yourself a flat, a house, or a car. You had to wait for this house to be constructed for you. You had to wait for this car to be produced for you. Which, that's why the consequences of these economic reforms in the 1990s were so drastic for us. People lost all most of their savings, right? So. It means only one thing, that people are reluctant to invest. And when people are reluctant to invest, it means what? That your economy is what? But kind of underfueled with money, right? That this money is pretty much what? A dead weight, right? They just keep this money either in the bank or under their pillow or somewhere just, I don't know, a hole in the ground, or whenever you can keep your money, right, in the chest. Uh, right? But this money does not work, right? This money is not being invested or even spent. Again, a question to you. For Austrian companies, is it a good thing that Russia has such a... And actually, Russia has one of the world's high savings rates. The high rate is only in China, right? Which is kind of a paradox, right? On one hand, China is a fast developing country with very good well, indicators and very good macro figures, but they still, they still save a lot. Uh, so, is it good for Austrian businessmen that Russia has such a high savings rate? Why not, just a moment? Because this money could be reinvested, reinvested in Austrian business, but it is not. Right, so on the, sur kind of on the surface level, you're absolutely right. This money is indeed dead weight, so money is not being spent, not being spent on Austrian goods or in Austrian projects, that's true. Uh, who said it was good? Yes, why is it good? <laughs> uh, actually, both of you are absolutely correct, right? Um, as I said earlier, if you are asked a comparative question, it usually has both sides to it, right? So, on one hand, it's indeed quite bad for the economy, it's bad for business, for foreign business, and generally, well, but at the same time, it provides a great opportunity. A great opportunity to what? To foreign business, Austrian business in particular. Why? Because your main goal, once you grow big and, well, rich, and if you decide to invest in Russia, the only thing that you will have to care about with such a high savings rate is going to be what? As you said, to find a way how to extract this particular money from people. How can you make people part with their big savings? It means that people have money. You just need to take it from them, right? So how do you do that? Either great advertisement, but I don't think you can amaze anybody now with no matter what you try, well, but still, it's more or less 
we we'll already see advertisement, advertisement, right? Pretty much when we encounter it. Uh, what else? Exactly. You either provide a proper image or you provide such a good and services that are either this particular population, in this case Russian, population has not encountered before or, well, have not encountered before in a proper quality, right? What, what potential spheres are those? What do you think? No bureaucracy, for example. Oh, no bureaucracy. Well, uh, what particular companies, Austrian companies, may invest in Russia? Uh, that's a nice question, yes. Oil and Yes, very good. Yes, the energy companies, right? Because Russia, despite, despite us having leading positions in terms of even technologies when it comes to at least onshore drilling, we're pretty bad at offshore drilling, but onshore we're great. Right, so yes, but it's still... Energy, what else? What other spheres apart from energy? Yes, exactly, financial sector. Because again, as we mentioned before, Austrian banks are very, very, very good, right? There are a lot of foreign banks on the Russian market. Can you name some? Raffaizer, right? Unicredit. Right. Uh, well, uh, today, uh, again, we have... Um, uh, t -t Today, uh, we have the head of Rosbank uh, having a lecture for my students, students of my um, faculty, and Rosbank is basically what? Cité Générale, right? It's basically a branch of the French bank. So, uh, so it's banks. What else? Medicine. Right, right. What else? Chemical industry, kind of in general, right? And also what you are pretty much already investing in is construction, it's infrastructure. If we look at this, what we see here again is another map. It's a map of Russia. Where do you think most of the Austrian investment is located? European part. European part. Again, what seems odd about this map, if anything? The Russian part, well, you might uh, you know what this is. But from left to right, from west to east, regions tend to become what? Less populated. Less populated and are thicker, right? Because you just, there's, no, there's no need to have a small region when it's not populated at all, so it's easier to have a big one, right? Uh, but okay, how did it happen? Why? Why isn't Russia populated all the time? So <laughs> 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 actually, one thing that even Russian students attempt to forget is one third of Russia is within the Arctic Circle. It's permafrost, and what does permafrost mean? You can't have any economic activity there. Though we do have economic activity there, there being oil and gas extraction from the northern seas, from the Arctic Ocean. But still, again, one third of the country. Just think about it. Right? So no matter how big Russia is, it's not a habit basically at all. Right? The tradition, traditional, I mean kind of up till, until the 17th century, Russia was a relatively small country, actually. Right? That's pretty much it. Right? And that's it. Well, later, we started expanding partly to the south and to the east, and we started, well, just it's called colonizing Siberia, right? There, there was pretty much nothing to call it. So Siberia was there, That's much. Uh, and as a result, Russia became a federative state, right? And by the way, Russia is quite interesting federative state. You know that there are basically two types of federations. Some federations are formed by what? By territories that mm -hmm. just join. And some are formed by what? National. By nations or national borders, to put it correctly, right? Mm -hmm. What type is Russia? Both. Both. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you look carefully, you will see that some of the names of the Russian regions, uh, even if you don't know the Russian, but still you can see this sound what? Not, not Russian, right? For example, Yamalonets, Russian, right? Uh, so, another, but and some have what well, pretty much Ru Russian esque names, right? Uh, so, why is that? Because some of them are national borders. Most of those tribes and people that live there, when they joined Russia, uh, and other, well, they are just, well, were formed artificially, so to say. Right? 
So, but still, the more densely populated places there, that absolute majority of Austrian investments go square to Moscow and to St. Petersburg. Right? Have you already been to St. Petersburg, Austrian investments? Yes? Some yes, some no yes. Well, did you, did you like it? I was like, yes, for a lot more. It reminds me of an old cemetery. Why is that? It's not very, very un Russian and very built for another time, for another age. That's my best one. about the city. Anyway, uh, so most of it was located here. It's a little thing. On my hand, again, yes. Because Moscovites and people who live in the Moscow and Central region, as they call it, they are relatively well off, right? We can afford to buy you know, foreign goods and big quantities. And have you already noticed that some of the foreign goods are actually much what? Uh, much more expensive than they are technically supposed to be. Why is that? Partly because of the high savings rate, right? Because people have money. The more money you have, the higher you can afford to have your price. Right? So the only reason, of course, but still. Um, the paradox is that Russia, being such a huge country, in some cases, just think about it, bringing goods from abroad is economically more feasible than bringing them from Russia. The, the, the best example here is buying, for example, milk or dairy goods or stuff like that from uh, Baltic states or Belarus and bringing them to Moscow. It's much less costly than bringing them, say, from here, or from here, from our southern regions that are very fertile, right? Because of the transportation costs, because of the sheer size of this country, right? And uh, the usual thing that I like um, to tell my students is that Russia is actually bigger than the former planet Pluto. By size. It's the size of a small planet. Well, it's a continent. So if you look at it, so Russia is extremely big. But at the very same time, the Kropotkins have the greatest opportunities for, in this case, Austrian businessmen, is to do what? Not stick in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but, but to go where? To the provinces, to go to the regions. Because there, on one hand, people do not get as much. The average salary in Russia, in rubles, is 30,000 rubles, which makes sense 500 euros approximately. In Moscow, it's twice as much. So it's approximately 1,000 euros. A huge difference. But the regions are much more what? The demand there for foreign services, goods, and stuff is actually much what? Much bigger. Bigger. Because unlike central regions, they do have never really experienced this quality and this quantity before. Right? So, if you look carefully, as, well, unfortunately, there is no uh, example of, of how the Wall Street companies, but if you look at French or German or even American companies that work on the Russian market, those who understood that several, a decade ago, they are extremely profitable here. Because uh, it's not about making quick money in Russia, it never really actually works because of the political risks, the economic turnoff, and stuff like that. But if you invest, Long-term period, we are going to be extremely profitable. Now, just it's all over our time, and just the last slide. So, what again are the opportunities that I personally, again, whether you agree with me or not, just correct me if I'm wrong. What do we actually can do to make our club, countries closer, our relations better, the economic relations better, which is of prime importance? First, education. Right? Me being from Give more university, you know this university well. You know that we already have a lot of double degree programs, between bachelor's level, master's level, we have programs that are taught entirely in English, you know, those bachelor's and master's level. Uh, we have those graduate studies that also uh, in foreign languages. Uh, we have publications, for example, my faculty study for this year, I have a separate program in German language, which is not the bachelor's level. So first of all, education, because I'm pretty, pretty convinced that everything starts from young age, starts from education, right? Uh, what I really like, 
about my, my former students, and it so happens that I mostly have my classes with former students. I just have one or two classes with Russian students, but the rest is usually students from Italy, Germany, uh, Norway, Spain, Britain, and stuff. Uh, and uh, like that. So, what we like about uh, working with students is that the initial reaction to Russia, to our reality, to the country is very different from the one that they get afterwards. Because the initial reaction is always being afraid. I don't know why. Perhaps it's propaganda, perhaps it's just the image that we, we all inevitably have about different other countries, right? Uh, for example, there is Austria, so also have has some not entirely correct image of the country. But at the same time, education brings people closer and at the end of their courses, they are quite interested in either staying here, or at least investing here, or starting their business here, because now our courses would just explain how to do it easily, right? Uh, though, uh, well, according to the statistics that I managed to calculate, it's most of the chains the students that are most successful later on the Russian uh, market, but, well, still. Uh, so, second thing is internships, is again exchange, students exchange, MA students uh, on the MA level. Um, also, what's great about our university and well, generally companies in Russia in general is that, well, our university and companies that we work with closely are very keen on well, accepting foreign students, right? And what's great about foreign com uh, companies and countries that our students also visit foreign universities quite a lot. Uh, in between of the faculty, you know, each day assigned approximately from 5 to 10 uh, you know, the papers that confirm that our students can go to a foreign university to study there. They go and study there, right? So it's actually great. I really find it great. Um, another thing is business incubators, right? We have touched upon the spheres that are already here with us. I mean, uh, it's been construction, chemical, industry, energy, etc. But I think that creating business incubators is something that may help us well, brainstorm or just find out uh, by other means uh, some new fields where we can work together. Right? Because uh, meetings like this is a great virtual uh, place to think about. Right? It's a great place to get to know countries better, the economy better, the political situation. And the thing is that uh, creating such things usually works quite fine. Again, unfortunately, there is no example with Germany or Austria, but uh, we have such a business incubator with Britain. And it's just surprising that it works quite well. No matter how much red blood there is between Britain, UK, and Russia right now, unfortunately, because of the political. This is because still business, still, yeah, it just works, that's kind of good. Well, I look at the business and business, and by this I mean that uh, if you have time, I shall be glad to invite you to our university or to our faculty, either being an exchange student or for education or just for other well, meetings and as well, just um, conferences that we have, no matter. Uh, the one the event is, but we shall be glad to invite you and see you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah? Okay, thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, so, guys, now we have a break. We have a break. We have 30 minutes. At 12, 30 minutes, we have a break. We have a break. We'll be on the fifth floor. Well, I have to return to my work, actually. <laughs> <laughs>